All right, hey guys, we're at Western Iron Tech Day here in our Motorcycle and Power Sports Division. And what we're going to do today is we're going to start to talk about our um, synchronizing carburetors. I've brought a few different tools out here that we have to use. <coughs> and, uh, kind of thinking about carburetor synchronization, a lot of people think, well, is it worth it? Does it matter? How important is it? You know, how does it help? And so on. Well, definitely one of the big reasons we do carb sync is to make the engine run smoother, right? You guys probably heard that yeah, talk about yeah. that. And uh, <clears throat> with the different ways of doing it, this is uh, one of the old ways where we'll use a set of vacuum gauges, and we're going to put one on each cylinder of the vehicle. So if we had a, you know, a two-cylinder, we would just use two of these gauges, and so on, and make them all read the same as the idea. So we're going to pick uh, an RPM per the manual, and synchronize these at the same time. Now, one thing about carb sync. Yeah, as you guys know, so we start to go do it on the bikes. Is there's a lot of little steps. There's a lot of ways to do it wrong. Number one is that carb sync is actually supposed to be done technically with most manuals. It'll say to have the engine at operational temp, so everything's you know uh, settled and and expanded where it needs to be and set it at that. A lot of times, you guys are going to go to work at your shops and you're going to see that they'll check carb sync immediately after they throw a set of carbs on, throw some fuel to it, and they're going to check. And what they're really doing is just seeing, are we close? If I put a cup, if I put some gauges on there, even when the vehicle's cold, and this one is way out in left field, and this one is uh, down here, it's going to make sense to you that, yes, I need to move forward, I'm, I'm way off. If Even when the engine's cold, if the gauges are real similar to each other, there's probably a pretty good chance that they're synced. Yeah. So we're kind of using that as an idea, but make no mistake about it when we when we talk about this. Read the manual. If the manual says to run to full operational temp, then that's something that you would definitely want to do. We know the risks and dangers of taking a bike, putting it on a bench, and letting it sit and run for 10 minutes. It could overheat, get busy, walk away from it. So we want to make sure and cool it and and things like that. So your best bet is to go ride the motorcycle, getting it to temperature, and then come back and worry about carb sink. Um, another reason I think a lot of shops uh, just do it real quick is trying to deal with a hot engine in a hot area is a little uh, more dangerous from getting burnt and whatnot when you're trying to work on that. So, I, you know, we, a lot of times we'll talk about what you're supposed to do and what people really do, okay? So this is one tool that we use. Another brand here is uh, that you guys might recognize is this guy right here. So you're going to see here, um, the gauges seem to me to be a little bit harder to read because they're black compared to the white ones that I showed you before. This is from a company called KNL Supply. They're my favorite, but everybody has their own personal preference here. Um, another thing that would normally be on here, um, these were a set that just got donated. Somebody had them in boxes. There would be a little adjuster valve like this, and that's why I'm going to talk about how these gauges are not real practical, but you'll see what we can do with those as well. And then one of the final ones, this is a new tool we got in the last year or so here at the college and it is a digital sink gauge. So you've got some hose ports that come out of here and we got a few different settings on here. One thing that's really nice about this is we gain a tachometer. So if your motorcycle doesn't have a tach, here you go. If you, do, if you haven't picked out a tach yet and you think about, well, if a tach is a couple hundred bucks and this is four or five hundred, you start to look at, well, this might be a real handy tool to knock out two tools in one. Does that make sense? This is meant and designed for the motorcycle industry so it works really well a lot of complaints about tachometers is that they don't work well this one does work pretty good for us so we're going to get into that in a future uh, um, a future lesson but I just wanted to expose you guys to some of the tools that we're going to use so I'm going to talk about this guy right here I'm going to talk about why a lot of people don't like these okay so first off does anybody know anybody an old mechanic or whatnot says so oh, carb gauges are junk I just tune it by ear anybody know anybody like that no with you guys it's kind of a kind of a common complaint where somebody will say you know I've set the bike to those gauges and and I'll have a bike that's just running perfect and smooth and life is good and now all of a sudden I got them all equal and it's it's hunting or jumping or spitting and sputtering and they're like the gauges are junk the gauges are not junk there's two two areas that I want to focus on that we can make this tool amazing the first thing I want you to notice will you zoom in here and will you notice kind of grab these two gauges and you'll notice how this one has a plus one and it's handwritten we're good. You guys see that over here? Yeah. Okay, what we have going on there, and if you look at this one, this one says plus two. What I learned years ago was that 
the, the problem is, as much as they try to manufacture these and have them exactly equal, things happen, right? You have a little bit different tolerance when it's made or whatnot. So one thing that we always want to do is we want to check our tool to make sure that the tool has the capability to read the same. Now what we've done in the past, the reason this says plus one, and this, or excuse me, minus one, I'm sorry, I've been reading it upside down. This says minus one, this says plus two, is that these two gauges read the same, and how we check that is, let's say I have a four-cylinder vehicle. So I'm gonna take one gauge, and I'm gonna put it on the motor, on one motorcycle vacuum port and see what it reads. Then I'm gonna do all the other gauges. So you can see that these two gauges, let's just use for demonstration purposes, let's say they read 20. Well, that means that this gauge read 19, and this gauge read, makes sense? So now when I go to set the carburetors on this bike, I can't set them all equal because the gauge itself actually reads a little different. But if I set this one 20, 19, 20, and 22, are the carbs synced? Yep. Yeah. Pretty cool. Can you imagine how much human error develops right there? Sure. You know, because they're just like, ah, tool's junk. So what we're going to do is we're going to synchronize our tool first. Now we went ahead and wrote these on there because you'll notice here, this tool looks like it's in good shape. Yeah. This tool is not thrown in a drawer. It's hung up on its own uh, individual spot. It's not banged on. It's not dropped. If this tool were to be dropped um, or uh, abused in any way, would you potentially need to redo that test all the way around? Yeah. So just kind of think it through some of our tools that we have here. One of the things I was thinking we could do is use our Mighty Vac. We have a Blue Point one here that uh, comes in your guys' tool kits. And we've went ahead and tested the tool. So on the back of this, we have a pressure vacuum. I'm on the vacuum side of this. If I go ahead and pump this up, just hold my hand over here. I see that I have no leak. I'm able to sit here and hold. Nope, I take that back. Either I, I got to check that again. Did you notice it was leaking a little? Hope you guys could see that. Okay, so I might have a little loose fitment here, loose fitment here. That's why we brought our soapy water out. We're going to test this, find the leak, and we're going to make sure that uh, we can get this to work good. Part of it might just be me holding my hand over the end of this and not having a good seal. So the next thing I'm going to do is let's just use this outside gauge here. I'm going to take... Al, will you come over here and maybe hold this up for the camera? You just kind of uh, go like this on the bench here. I think that works good for you. Okay, so we're gonna focus on this gauge right here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pump this up. Now I would wanna go ahead and seal this up where there's no leaks, but instead of having to use a motorcycle, if I'm at, it doesn't matter if they match or not, but let's say I'm at 15 inches of vacuum on here and this one's 20. So for every other gauge that I pull 15 inches of vacuum, shouldn't they all have to read the same? Yeah. So you get my point here is I could take this read 15 and see that's 20. When I read 15, this one's gonna read 19, and that's where I put my minus one. If I went over to this guy and at 15 inches of vacuum here, and this only reads 18, then I would put minus two. And basically, that's how I would synchronize the gauges, okay? So that's a cool way to use our tools there to be able to uh, duplicate this without having to have a running vehicle. And Because to synchronize your gauges on one uh, engine, would you agree with me, it takes some time? Yeah. And the whole time you're doing that, it's getting hotter. The hotter that engine gets, could the vacuum change a little? Yeah. So you would end up with, you know, possible, uh, possibly telling it it's different than it really is because the engine temperature has actually changed, okay? So let's move on to point number two. I'm just gonna kind of move this out of our way here. This is the whole human air part again, okay? Now, when you get this, uh, it's been a while since I bought one of these, but when you buy this tool, it, you have to assemble it. So we gotta put our hoses on. And what's gonna happen is there's a lot of times that I tell you guys, hey, hand tight, don't sit and crank something down. In some of our recent carburetor videos, we were so particular about how you hold the screwdriver. Right? So I'm going to show you how this uh, is taken apart and I'm going to show you how people actually ruin it. Matter of fact, I'm going to right now, I'm going to ruin the tool. Okay? Everybody with me on that? I'm going to intentionally ruin it. Now what I'm able to do with these adjuster knobs is that on a running engine, this needle is going to fluctuate. So what you do is to start the use of this tool, you take all these and you lightly seat them. Did you hear that word? lightly okay and you're gonna see what's happening is this is just a simply a hose and inside of here there's a steel ball that pushes against that hose creating basically to pinch it off creating a restriction in the line 
Does that make sense? And what happens there, if we don't have the, if we don't uh, create the pinch in there, that needle will sit and bang back and forth. And that needle, any any type of gauge like this, has this pin right here. Can you focus in on that? Pressure gauges, oil pressure, doesn't matter what it is. Well, if that is allowed to bang against that, what do you think it does to the needle? Is that a possibility why this might read differently? If the needle's bent or tweaked, we're gonna have a problem. So you always start with these lightly closed and that will allow no measurable vacuum to be read. And then what you do is you lightly open this your needle will start to sit and dance like this and then you'll get it where it goes like this and you will close it back down till you get what you call a, a stable reading or a stable number. Does that, that make sense? Okay, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ruin it. I'm gonna be the guy who doesn't know and doesn't care and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna crank this thing down, okay? Now what I'm actually doing is I'm actually taking the ball in there and I'm shoving it through the hose. When I shove it through the hose, what do I create? A hole or a tear. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to purposely ruin this to make a point to show you guys this is why this tool can typically get a bad rap. So I've taken in, uh, hopefully without trying to actually break it, you can see the steel ball that's in here. Okay, and I'm going to take this apart. I'm going to take and use this little uh, tray right now, a holder for my pieces here. I want to roll off the bench. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, repair this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of hold this hose down in my blocking. And I'm going to unthread this. And you're going to see. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, slide this out. Look at where I have even brass filings in here. And uh, I don't know if you can see. It doesn't look like I pushed it hard enough. To actually sever the hose but we're going to find out here in a second so now what we do is just go ahead and take this assembly off and when you when you buy this from k l here's what you get you're going to get it like this well the la last time i i bought one we're just going to get these individual pieces the idea is we're going to come up through our hole or excuse me our brass fitting that our ball and our adjustable valve is going to go through this guy goes around the hose itself and what you really want to do is you want to slide this down okay and then you would go and you would put it up on the actual gauge okay are you with me then we're gonna slide this guy back into place it's kind of hard to do and make it work for the camera here now I have that nice and secure there and then I would come up with my fitting like so and I have to make this where it will land it has to land to where your knob is facing up. Does that make sense? Are you with me on that? Now what I'm gonna do is if I just even take this hose, we could see here. I'm sitting there all day long and I had no leak. Do you get what I'm saying? It's easier with the Mighty Vac, you don't have to mess with it. <clears throat> but if I had a tear in there, what would that? What would happen? It would sit and it would leak down. But I want to. I'm going to take this back apart and I'm going to demonstrate what I like to do with these. Um, and it's a couple reasons we had a couple of different tools left out here on the bench. So first off, we're going to take and disassemble it again. And you can see. Oh, oh. Get in here. I did tear it, didn't I? Is that is that? A noticeable on the camera there? Yep. Okay, rock on. Man, that's what I wanted to do. Because that is going to fail this tool, and then you get the guys, young or old, that are going to say, those things are junk. It's not the tool, it's the operator, okay? Now, the other thing is, on the last person who uh, repaired this or whatnot, I, I've got a little bit of a, a struggle with, they probably used the wrong tool. And if I take a pair of side cutters, do I get a rough cocked edge like that. No. If you if you look at the side cutter, the side cutter is angled here like this. A lot of people don't realize that if I want to cut a straight line, I actually have to hold the tool in a relationship like this to, to be able to get the best straight line. But it is hard to get a nice good cut with that, isn't it? So what my preferred method is, if we can focus right here, is I like a razor blade. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go below our damaged area and I'm going to simply just take a razor blade, get it nice and straight. Who's got me a good one here? 
Now, we kind of have this joke around here at the college that's pretty nice and square, isn't it? And we, we say this term a lot. I'm going to go ahead and wet this up just to make it easier for some. And don't use a WD-40 on this Y. What's that? Probably not, but it won't, it, won't, it won't dry. We want this to be a good dry connection. That lubricant will allow this to maybe slip around or whatnot. You're better off just using some spit or soapy water. So I'm going to take and uh, just kind of slide this down a little bit. The point, the reason I was trying to say to use the razor blade is, and, and the little joke that we have around here is we always use that term real estate, right? Mm -hmm. if, that, if that hose is cut at an angle, and the, the angle is going to hit that first, and that's going to give me less of a good seal around that fitting, right? right? So do you understand why I like the razor blade? Mm -hmm. All right. So once again, we're going to be in place here. I've got my my uh, compression, this is just like a compression ring, in place. And I'm going to slide this guy up like so. Now, do you notice how I hold the hose? Mm -hmm. What I don't want is I don't want to, I don't want to thread the hose because I might tear it or crink it or wrinkle it or whatnot. So there's going to be a little friction along here. I feel like I'm good here. If I win another turn, I feel like I'm going to end up having a problem. I'm going to go ahead. Right now, I should be able to... Test my uh, life's good, right? And now, okay, I can just set the ball in there, thread it back on, and that's it. That's how you do that, okay? So once again, you know, our ultimate goal is is that we don't want to have failures. We don't want to take these. Uh, um, we don't want to take these expensive tools and go to use them on the vehicle and actually make a bike wrong. And I'll tell you what, in, in the days of carbs, carb sink normally doesn't ever go out. Matter of fact, a lot of manuals will actually say, if you didn't touch it, leave it alone. We set it at the factory and it's good to go. A lot of times that you guys just start taking your carbs apart on the adjuster screws, do you notice how there's like a, uh, a, uh, uh, like a paste? It's like a colored Loctite, if you will, or lock patch or whatnot. That's because they're saying, hey, you know what, we did it. The problem is when you take the carbs off, it, if you were to disassemble the rack, you 100% have to resync those carbs, okay? The, the problem that we've seen is that people, you guys have noticed this too, they're kind of careless how they store things. You know, if I buy a set of carbs off the internet and uh, it hasn't been packaged well and it's been able to be bounced and banged around, there's a chance that the, the body or the plates are going to be tweaked a little. Does that make sense? So ultimately, we know uh, we have the tools available and we know how to do this that we're going to just double check it and uh, make it good to go. Does that make sense? Any questions about um, how to at least uh, check your tools so far? All right, well, this is part one of a multi-video uh, series on how we're going to actually do carp sync.